Hi guys, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, good, good, good. So thank you so much uh, for coming today. Um, it is our part of our professional development series, so we really appreciate everybody that's on the call. And of course, thank you, George, uh, for being able to do this. I know it was a little bit of a short notice, but we really appreciate you doing this. Um, so today as presenter, we have George Salazar. So he will be going over his um, his journey from Corpus Christi to where he is at now at NASA. So um, without further ado, I will pass it on to George. All right, thank you, Jackie. And uh, let me uh, share my screen here. All right, can you see that? Yes. All right, yes, excellent. <clears throat> all right, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, uh, Litos uh, Ola. Uh, for inviting me to speak to your group and uh, you know share my story, I uh, I know there's a lot of stories out there, but uh, you know career development and you know overcoming uh, uh, obstacles along the way, and I'm and I'm I'm very happy and proud to share my story. So um, what I'm going to be doing is uh, talking a little bit about uh, my background. I will be saying a few words about my my schooling and. Uh, then I'll start jumping into my uh, uh, the NASA careers, uh, and as well as the uh, new direction that I'm taking as far as uh, being part of NASA for 30 plus years now, and some final words. So uh, let's begin with my background, and uh, I uh, want to say that you know everybody has a a career path or life path, if you will. And for a, a lot of the people that I've known over the years, you know, I, I have to say that going from point A to point B is typically uh, not always, but a straight line. And maybe they deviate a little bit. Uh, maybe there's a dead end here and there, but for the most part, they're, they're able to uh, uh, reroute, so to speak, and, you know, re, uh, recalculating, as the old uh, GPS is used to say, and, uh, and get back on track. I have to say, for the most part, uh, my life path uh, going from A to B looks something like this uh, with a bunch of uh, dead ends and uh, rerouting and, and, and uh, going forward. But in the end, I, I was able to, uh, to, to get to where I am right now. And I have to say, and I'll say a little more words about it later, is that I, never, I didn't think I would ever get to NASA. And so uh, I, I remember seeing the Apollo landings and all that. And the, it was just a far dream for me uh, coming from uh, the bodies of Corpus Christi. Uh, speaking of which, let me uh, just say a, a few words about where I'm from, um, where I'm from. And so Corpus Christi, they call it the sparkling city by the sea there on the left-hand side. You see a, a, a aerial view of the, uh, of the T heads as they call them. And then the L heads where a lot of the boats are uh, uh, usually uh, docked and there's fishermen that come there and, and drop off their fish and sell them uh, wholesale, if you will, to, to the public. Uh, Corpus Christi, for those of you who are not familiar, it's uh, located about 200 miles south of here. It's uh, uh, pretty close to Brownsville, about a couple of hours from Brownsville and the valley, which uh, I do have a lot of family down in the valley. And, um, you know, one, one big celebrity, I have to say, from Corpus Christi was... Uh, uh, Selena, that uh, or the late Selena, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, murdered, and uh, you know her life ended too early in in her career. I think uh, so. Uh, anyway, that's uh, where Corpus Christi is at. So let's uh, dig deeper into uh, uh, Corpus Christi and kind of home in on a little bit about me. So these are my grandparents on my dad's side. That's my grandfather on the left hand side. Uh, interesting enough, he was half Yaki. And uh, half uh, and half, uh, uh, it was a mixture of Portuguese. That is, uh, is the grand, my great granddad or his dad uh, was part Portuguese and part Spaniard. Uh, but the mom or my my great uh, grandmother was uh, full blooded Yaqui. On the right hand side is my grandmother, and she was uh, part Spaniard. Uh, they had no formal education. Uh, my grandfather had, uh, with my grandmother, had three sons, uh, and one was my dad. And here's a picture of my dad with my mom. Uh, this is up in Ohio. 
uh, where they used to go in the summertime and uh, pick fruit and uh, pick vegetables. Uh, one of the funny stories about my, my dad uh, saying about my mom is that my mom could outpick any man uh, there in the in the picking fields. Uh, uh, one man one told, once told my dad, uh, you married a machine because uh, she was just nonstop and uh, she would just go, go, go. So I, I do have to say that uh, that between my grandparents and, and my parents, uh, that uh, they instilled on me a work ethic, a very strong work ethic, work ethic, as well as responsibility and having compassion. Um, you know, we grew up in a modest home, and this is uh, pretty much what it looked like. Uh, it was a shotgun house, uh, probably about 15 feet wide, about 25 feet long, uh, three, uh, three rooms in there. Uh, there was a living room as you walked in, then there was a, a bedroom and, <clears throat> and then a kitchen, and uh, the restroom was uh, outside. But uh, it was a, it was a, uh, you know, it was a humble uh, growing up in, in that area. And I do have to say that uh, despite uh, not having all the money in the world, so to speak, or, or being well off or whatever you want to call it, uh, they did instill on me one uh, philosophy that I have to say is, uh, uh, is reflected on this model that no one has ever become poor from giving. And that was my mom and my dad and my grandparents. I mean, they, they gave what they could. Uh, uh, later, I'll talk about a donor shop and I'll say a few things about that. Um, I have to say that uh, for the, for, from a uh, Hispanic heritage standpoint, I call it the uh, four Fs, fun, family, faith, and food. So fun, you know, we used to play bingo on Sundays and, you know, we used to get together and it was just uh, wonderful, you know, to, to have everybody in, in those little, that little small house, uh, as, crowded, as small as it was, you know, we were able to get a whole bunch of folks in there uh, you know, piñatas during birthdays, you know, was fun, too, as well. Uh, music, uh, that was very much uh, around in uh, my house. Uh, my grandfather used to listen to, uh, you know, polka music, uh, cumbia music. Uh, Sonny and the Sunliners from uh, San Antonio, Texas, were very big uh, in Corpus Christi, and I used to hear that music uh, growing up. And of course, dancing, my gosh, you know, uh, Hispanics and dancing, you know, uh, polkas and uh, uh, there was a place called the Memorial Coliseum in Corpus Christi that just to fill up uh, when Sonny and the Sunliners would come or other uh, uh, conjuntos, as they call them, uh, Mexican bands, you know, it, it was just a, an incredible experience. Uh, it was just uh, uh, very uplifting and, and uh, very lively. Uh, you know, certainly the faith part uh, was, uh, you know, the uh, church uh, going on Sundays uh, uh, to church. Uh, and of course, uh, during Christmas time, uh, midnight mass. And uh, it, it was just a uh, it was just a wonderful experience as uh, being part of a Hispanic family. Uh, and of course, I can't forget, you know, the, the, the beans and homemade flour tortillas uh, that my grandma and my, my mom used to make. I have to say that uh, refried beans, or maybe uh, what we used to call uh, uh, frijoles a la charra, or sometimes they call them charro beans, and uh, freshly made uh, homemade tortillas. And to me, that was cuisine eating, I, I'm, I'm telling you. But of course, uh, not to be out down with, uh, with flour tortillas and, and uh, uh, Mexican beans is uh, pan dulce or sweet bread. Oh my gosh, on Sundays, you know, we uh, you know, for five bucks back then, you could buy a whole bunch of sweet bread and then, you know, take it to the house and play uh, Mexican bingo. So it, it's uh, again, you know, it, some people call it the, the five F's of the uh, Hispanic heritage where there's fun, family, faith, food and football. Uh, it, it was, football wasn't as popular when I was growing up, uh, not the uh, soccer type as, uh, as we know football to be in the Hispanic uh, world, but more so uh, American football. All right, so background. Uh, you see a picture here, a notional picture of, uh, a, uh, of a junkyard and a, a tree. And you see the soldiers and, and an airplane and the, these monsters and this uh, uh, what's called slot car racing. So what is that? What does this all mean? Well. Um, let me just say, uh, let me just kind of bring all this up and, and just kind of describe it. So 
the junkyard was one that was not too far from where I was growing up. And there's where we used to, uh, friends of mine and I used to take uh, material from there and build things like uh, a tree house. And of course, the tree house here that you see uh, depicts a rather sturdy tree house compared to what we built because the first one we built uh, came apart when uh, we all got in it, all three of us. Uh, but we learned a lesson uh, about building. And I, I consider this engineering and training. Uh, the soldiers uh, reflects, uh, you know, that's something I could afford for 99 cents at a five and 10 cent store. You could buy a whole bunch of soldiers. And I was very much into uh, the uh, superheroes, you know, Batman, Green Hornet, uh, Superman and uh, Wonder Woman. Well, I decided that I was going to back then they didn't have superheroes. So I made my own out of the soldiers and I used to cut cut them up. <laughs> with uh, with uh, my grandfather's uh, shaving uh, razor blade. It was one of those double-edged razor blades. I cut myself along the way too, but I would also get bubble gum, chew a lot of bubble gum and create muscles on these uh, soldiers and kind of uh, contour them to these superheroes. Well, uh, as you can imagine, uh, you, you one would ask, well, what about Wonder Woman? Um, one of the soldiers became Wonder Woman, and I have to say that it was probably uh, my early version of a transvestite, <laughs> if you will, of taking a soldier and making it to, uh, to Wonder Woman. I uh, also learned to build my own uh, airplanes, and uh, the, one of the first ones that I ever built at the age of six was an F-104, very similar to this picture right here. But I also got into uh, uh, building mummy, uh, rather, um, uh, they had these uh, monster uh, kits that you could build models. And so I built the mummy, the Wolfman, Frankenstein, and Dracula. And of course, the, the money was donated by my uncle who uh, saw that I love building models. And so he donated the money to, you know, for me to build a lot of these. I have to say that uh, it was troubling to my mom because my mom would see me build the werewolf and Frankenstein. And I still remember her, uh, you know, would say, uh, ay Dios, and she wouldn't make the sign of the cross saying that I was probably possessed, but you know, I just enjoyed that. Uh, the uh, slot car racing, that was my, uh, during junior high school, I, uh, I, I started to learn about electricity and uh, controlling slot cars. I made my, I, I made my own motors. I uh, rewind my mo own motors. Uh, and so I, I learned a few things about electricity, again, part of the engineering and training. So the donor maker at the age of 10, uh, we finally got out of uh, somewhat of the, uh, out of the ghetto, so to speak, when my dad have it, had the opportunity to buy a donor shop that he had been working there for many years. And there was no such thing as uh, a uh, allowance. I had to work for my money. And so at the age of 10, he put me to work and uh, I first started used to go clean the place up and what have you. But he said, if you want to make more money, you know, you know, you you would learn how to make donuts. And so he would get a, a, a tomato a wooden box. And uh, so I could uh, get up on top of the table high enough where I could make donuts. So at the age of 10, I was making donuts. There's a picture of me. Uh, I was the age of 15 where I was uh, I was making donuts to the left is a picture of my mom that I cut out. Uh, being a teenager, when they took this picture, you know how some teenagers are with uh, with parents, and you know, regrettably, I I, I wish I had not done done, done that. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, that's uh, you know that was uh, uh, it, it was a learning experience about responsibility because at the age of 16, my dad suffered a heart attack, and I had to run the business in order in order for our families to eat. Uh, there on the four, uh, on the left hand side, you see a shoe box. It's, I still have the shoe shine box uh, when I was uh, uh, shining shoes. Uh, as you can see there, it was a very good rate, 15 cents. <laughs> um, I also did other jobs too. Uh, at the age of nine, uh, I was uh, uh, helping out a, a, um, a bakery uh, before the donut shop. And uh, that uh, basically I could uh, sweep and mop and uh, earn uh, sometimes 50 cents along with two oatmeal cookies freshly made. So uh, uh, I love that. Um, so jobs after high school, uh, you know, Hurricane Celia struck Corpus, devastated, devastated our business, and we worked to, and we moved to Houston. I worked in construction and I have to, with my uncle, I have to say that I learned a lot about uh, woodworking and it actually helped me uh, build a lot of things uh, for my kids and for my family and for the house. 
I saw I sold books door to door, and boy, did I find out quickly people did not want to be bothered on weekends uh, with a book salesman. Uh, I went back to making uh, donuts. Uh, my mom found me a job, and I was uh, doing donuts again uh, and making pretty good money, in fact. Uh, in fact, I was working two donut shops uh, here in Houston, one in the North Houston Roslyn, the other one on the Southwest Freeway. Um, but I also worked at Kmart part time and in building materials. And I, but I, I started to see that uh, I was getting pretty tired, my back, you know, back breaking work, and it was a, uh, it was probably time to make a change in the career. So uh, I applied at Xerox uh, for a copier tech job. My sister had said, uh, you know, they're taking applications for it. Well. Uh, yeah, they were, but I had to take a test. And so the test uh, was mostly electronics, digital electronics. So I saw these AND gates, OR gates. I, I call them AND gates and OR gates now because back then I didn't know what they were. And a truth table. And I had no clue what that meant. I, I, I was not trained in digital electronics, obviously. And and so it was, you could have well just written uh, Japanese language uh, and I wouldn't have known the difference. Uh, and then the, my sister said, well, they're also taking a job uh, opportunities at IBM. And so I applied for the IBM copiers, one of their big ones that they had uh, in a lot of corporations here in Houston. Um, I did good in the electrical part because I had been I've been studying up on electrical and transformers and things of that sort. But I did not do well in mechanical. Uh, it was rather a complex uh, problem that they gave me for mechanical systems. I, uh, I said, OK, it's time to try to get some uh, uh, college and some education. So I attended what used to be a college in, in Houston called Durham College. And it was uh, one of those, uh, you know, in nine months, you get a degree and we'll find you a job. But I was very disappointed with it. Uh, and uh, this was right before I got married. So uh, I dropped out of that school because I, I was not learning anything from, from that uh, professor that uh, was teaching at that college. So uh, let me just say a little bit about uh, my high school background is that I graduated uh, 473 out of 605. So uh, lower 20 percent, uh, pretty poor showing. I, I, uh, a lot of factors uh, came into play there, including I was running the donut shop while while working, uh, rather while going to school. So. Uh, that, along with other interests, uh, kind of impacted my uh, my academics, if you will. So uh, I uh, uh, I knew that it was going to be a challenge. It, it was either failure or success. So returning to college, uh, I knew it was not going to be a simple uh, straight path. I took a I took the SAT at the University of Houston, <laughs> and I scored something like 450. I can't. It was a it was a pretty uh, poor showing, and so I got a letter. Uh, we wish you the best of luck, you you know, in, in your future endeavors and, and all that stuff. But I didn't let that stop me. I found a junior college uh, at that time called North Harris County College, located just north of Intercontinental Airport, that accepted me on a probation basis. They said, uh, OK, if you can do a B average or, or better the uh, first semester with 12 hours, uh, we'll keep you. So I, uh, I talked to counselors and it looked like electronics was going to be the area for me. So uh, I majored in electronics technology, and the first semester I scored a, an A, and they kept me. <laughs> and uh, within two years, I got my associate's in applied science, and so I transferred over to the University of Houston, first to the College of Technology. But I was kind of disappointed that I didn't feel uh, challenged enough. And so I joined an organization at that time called the Mexican American Engineering Society. Now it's called the Society of, of uh, Mexican Engineers and Scientists. And they said, uh, well, look, you know, if you're not feel like you don't feel like you're being challenged, then uh, why don't you switch over to engineering? So I did. But the the, the part that kind of uh, puzzled me or kind of made me a little bit leery was that I was learning that a lot of folks in engineering were transferring over to technology because it's a lot easier. And here I was going in the opposite direction. And uh, challenge, it was a challenge. Hold on to your, uh, you know, hold on to dear life because uh, I had to, you know, take all the calculus and advanced mathematics and, and what have you. I do have to say that uh, uh, some of the work that I did in electronics uh, that I'll mention later uh, helped me in, uh, in the kind of uh, 
establishing a rapport with some of the professors because I, I knew a lot about uh, laboratory instrumentation associated with electronics uh, 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 troubleshooting. So I got my degree in electrical engineering from the University of Houston. There's a picture of me with my first daughter, uh, Patricia. Uh, she was born the last semester, and uh, boy, was that was a challenge because uh, I, you know, at, uh, she was uh, every two hours waking up, uh, feeding, and what have you. And uh, I have to say that uh, somehow I made it uh, the last semester. I uh, took two of the hardest uh, electrical engineering classes that last, uh, rather three of the hardest electrical engineering classes and elective, um, but uh, I, I made it somehow. Uh, fast forward uh, 21 years later, I got my uh, master's in systems engineering uh, from SMU. There you see a picture of my uh, daughter, Patricia, that I'm holding as an, uh, ba with my bachelor's on, on my right-hand side, your left, and then Vicky's, uh, Vicky on, on the, on the left-hand side or your right. Uh, Tricia is, uh, She's a, uh, uh, both of them are, are uh, well uh, accomplished uh, folks, uh, excellent uh, careers they chose. Trisha chose uh, uh, nursing. She's got a master's uh, in nursing. Uh, Vicky got a, a bachelor's in, uh, in, in the area of, uh, of uh, construction and management and interior design, kind of a multi uh, 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 degree. And uh, she's now a project manager at DPR Construction in Austin, Texas. Uh, very proud of them. So uh, some, let me talk about the electronics experience at NASA and going to NASA and how this, uh, the, my experience helped me with NASA. So uh, while going to university, I, was, uh, I found a job at Canon Calculators because I had an associate's uh, of, uh, of applied science and electronics technology. They took me uh, there and I was under a... Uh, a Japanese lead technician by the name of Hoshino, uh, we call him Andy, and uh, you know he noticed that I was using my probes, a multimeter probe that you see there, uh, using both hands. And he said, uh, that's no way to check a transistor or check a circuit. You need to use chopstick method. And I had no clue what he was talking about. And then he showed me. Uh, so he showed me how to use uh, the probes as chopsticks so that way I could free up my hand uh, to check a transistor or hold a circuit board and do uh, trace uh, uh, trace analysis using chopstick methods. On weekends, uh, I used to, my wife and I used to go to the Chinese restaurants and I would practice uh, picking up peas or uh, grains of, uh, of rice, you know, to get more dexterous in the, the chopstick method. Interesting enough, I've, I've shared this uh, method with university students now and uh, some, uh, I understand that uh, some of the students <laughs> use that method or have been using that method uh, in their labs. Um, I wanted to get a co-op job because uh, I had learned uh, from some professionals that came and talked to uh, the university students that if you don't have a very good GPA, that uh, work experience some, sometimes compensates for that. And so I tried applying at NASA because uh, NASA was really uh, hot and heavy into uh, uh, the shuttle program, but I got declined because I didn't have a high enough G, uh, GPA. So I got uh, a, uh, uh, I landed a co-op job at engineer uh, GeoSource uh, as an engineering technician uh, that made geophones. Uh, uh, I also got involved with fiber optics cables. It was the early stages of fiber optics uh, communications, uh, assembly line robotics. I, uh, I got to uh, work with some engineers on developing robotics. Uh, systems for the assembly line to streamline the, uh, the, uh, the assembly line and data acquisition as well as how all these sensors, which uh, in some cases there are as many as 2,500 sensors on, on a uh, distribution line coming into a, uh, a, uh, what they call the big stopper, which was a uh, remote vehicle that, had, that acquired data for uh, uh, geophysicists to analyze uh, what's under the ground. Uh, so I, uh, NASA came, uh, and as part of uh, NASA interviews, I also inter interviewed with other companies. And uh, interesting enough, uh, I, I, I got uh, further uh, interviews along with uh, NASA. I didn't expect that. But uh, Robert uh, Brown, who was uh, at that time branch chief for the, the crew and thermal systems, which uh, does spacesuit, like the fact that I had work experience in engineering and also electronics background. And interesting enough, he, he shared a story, a story with me that uh, said, 
basically that uh, one of the reasons why the shuttle, uh, rather the Apollo program was so successful that a lot of the engineers uh, were already uh, experienced engineers uh, in, in the field. So uh, anyway, uh, long story short, I, um, I went to NASA to interview and I told the division chief at that time, uh, Mr. Ralph Sawyer, that uh, I had other offers and uh, he wanted me to come on board and he took no for an answer. And uh, long story short, he got human resources to uh, talk with me and I agreed to uh, uh, come work at NASA. So uh, I have to say that uh, I, I have my, my, I'm thankful that the human resource guy um, uh, was able to talk to me. So one of the key factors that decided for me to come work at NASA was stability because I didn't have that on my list of uh, desirements, if you will, for a company. I had, you know, challenges and, and, and money and all that, but not stability. And, and I reflected back on my dad losing jobs and being laid off and all that. So that hit pretty heavy and I, I had a family. So I, 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 I saw that uh, NASA was the way to go. Uh, so let me just talk briefly about uh, some projects at NASA, and I'll, I'll just kind of go briefly through these. So the first one, that uh, the big one that I had was the Modular Auxiliary Data System. There you see a picture of uh, uh, some of the boxes that were associated uh, with the Modular Auxiliary Data System, which was a data acquisition system on the shuttle that monitored something like 2,500 parameters associated with uh, acoustics, uh, uh, pressure, temperature vibration this data was brought back and uh it was on at first on on a reel to reel uh, uh, recorder and then later became solid state but uh it was uh, decommutated there in building 44 and at the nasa johnson space center and uh it was distributed uh, to the engineers to analyze the the performance of the shuttle i started when the uh, sts7 well, was getting ready to fly which was uh, Sally Ride's uh, uh, maiden voyage uh, on, on the shuttle spacecrafts. Um, I also was involved with voice control, uh, two experiments that, uh, that uh, I was uh, the, uh, I, had, I had multiple hats. Uh, I had the pro a designer, I had uh, project management and also systems engineering. In fact, that was my early introduction to systems engineering, which I didn't know anything about. And then I got involved with the X-38, uh, developing the flight critical computers on the X-38 and learned even more about systems engineering. Um, audio terminal unit, uh, I was involved with that uh, as part of the development of uh, what was the Space Station Freedom. Interesting enough, uh, uh, the Space Station Freedom, or, or rather the Space Station, the audio, uh, it was called the Internal Audio and Video System. So I had a responsibility for the audio system that was the only system that survived the redesign uh, that uh, and, and today that that space station freedom internal audio video, video design which was designed by harris uh, uh harris corporation um uh, uh, was the only thing that survived um uh shuttle shuttle cockpit aviata upgrade that was a major uh, major project uh, it was to upgrade the uh, computer systems uh on the space shuttle by intercepting gp uh, the general purpose computer uh, data that was usually used for the ground and uh, shipping it over to the displays to provide more situational awareness for, for the astronauts. Um, I also got involved with uh, OLEDs. Uh, so this, this kind of work I enjoyed was research work uh, investigating the, the capabilities of organic light emitting diodes uh, for future spacecraft missions. Uh, uh, right now, I'm currently the uh, subsystem manager for the uh, uh, commercial crew. And SpaceX is uh, one of them that I've been involved with. Uh, the display, uh, uh, what's called the control panel, was one of the uh, major activities that I was involved with SpaceX. And uh, I was very proud and happy to see that uh, it was a successful flight of Demo 2. And it was the first ever uh, touchscreen uh, ever used for command and control of a spacecraft. I'm also uh, involved with the uh, Starliner, which is the uh, Boeing uh, spacecraft system. And most recently, I'm also getting involved with the humor lander system uh, in displays and controls. Uh, additional contributions, I, I am also uh, one of the founding members of the Hispanic Employee Research Group at Johnson Space Center called HERG. Uh, but also, uh, uh, this was a weird one. I'm also one of the founding members of the uh, Human Systems Integration Employee Resource Group, which is the only technical resource group uh, at the Johnson Space Center. But uh, the, the, uh, 
the attempt here was to try to, to infuse into engineering the engineering community um, a uh, an awareness and understanding that when you, one is developing systems for humans that you've got to factor the human at the equal level as hardware and software. You can have the best hardware, they can have, you can have the best software, but if the human cannot operate the system or gets confused and makes the wrong operation uh, uh, move, if you will, uh, that causes a, uh, a catastrophic event, uh, heaven forbid, then the system as a whole has failed. And so uh, we, we created splinter groups and uh, one of the groups that uh, uh, came off of the employee resource group was developing uh, what we call the human systems integration uh, domains. All these domains, human factors engineering, safety, training, habitability and environment, maintainability and supportability and operations resources, uh, all factor the human element in, into the design of the systems where we, uh, we uh, basically uh, not have the knowledge and understanding when we're developing systems using the human systems integration as part of the systems engineering process that we factor in the limitations and capabilities of the human. Um, and re most recently, I'm getting involved with the, uh, the uh, human systems integration IEEE uh, working group. Uh, this is out of Sandia Laboratory, developing uh, what's called the uh, uh, human readiness level. And so there's something called the technology readiness level that many of us uh, in engineering understand that. Uh, as as far as uh, the readiness and maturity of technology, uh, but there's nothing that says uh, about is the human ready to use this system or is the system ready for the human? And so uh, we're developing a human readiness level that basically equates to the human readiness level uh, to help managers uh, primarily understand the risk, the cost, and uh, what are the challenges of uh, developing this system uh, for, especially for us in the spacecraft industry, uh, human rated systems, uh, and more so uh, in critical applications of a, of a human uh, controlling a spacecraft system. Um, right now, the uh, I'm going to be in a I'm going to be a moderator at a uh, let's say human ergonomics uh, uh, society uh, conference uh, next month. And uh, we're also still involved with uh, this work, and hopefully by next year, this becomes an ANSI standard, uh, just like uh, technology readiness level. So I'm very proud of uh, being involved with this kind of work too, as well. So you know, I've gone, uh, I've learned, or uh, let's say that I've, I decided to uh, expand my 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 knowledge, if you will, of just not just uh, engineering associated with hardware and software. But understanding the human, and um, you know, for those of you that have worked with all three of them, you know, hardware and software uh, can be deterministic, but the human is very <laughs> non-deterministic, and that's one of the challenges of designing human computer, human computer interfaces. So, uh, over the years, I've held uh, positions in electronics engineering, uh, senior engineer, project engineer, subsystem manager. Uh, project manager, deputy branch manager, that's where I found out I wanted to stay technical, uh, uh, systems engineering, which I loved, and you know that's why I pursued a master's in systems engineering, and right now I'm the human computer interface technical discipline lead, um, and each uh, project that I, under, I, I undertook, I, I, I gained more knowledge about spacecraft engineering and working with people, design for safety and reliability, project planning, coordination, soft skills, which is a biggie that I've learned uh, over the years. And I share that with students now. That's just not the hardware skills uh, that, that that makes you a well-rounded engineer, especially if you're going to get into systems engineering, but the soft skills associated with leadership, uh, negotiations, problem solving, teaming are, are also critical as, as for being a successful engineer. Uh, the human element of system, uh, human systems integration as well. Uh, systems engineering and systems thinking uh, as well. And unexpected surprises along the way. I got the Madaya de Oro from uh, uh, Mayas uh, back in the 90s. Uh, it was a surprise to me, but it was uh, dealing with uh, contributions uh, to uh, helping uh, students and uh, in, in their careers. I also got a, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, Great Minds in STEM, a total surprise. Uh, 
Uh, I'll never forget that one because it was in 2013 and that's when we, uh, the government was shut down. And initially I was not uh, allowed to travel there because uh, we were on furlough. And so uh, I can't tell you how many people at the Johnson Space Center uh, uh, jumped on board and said, no way, you're going to go. And I said, because I'm going to pay for it. And, and so uh, anyway, I had legal, uh, had people all the way up to headquarters supporting me. And so I finally got to go and, and, and receive my award uh, in person. That lady to the right uh, was um, uh, a Langley uh, director that presented me that uh, award. Um, I recently got the John F. Kennedy Astronautics Award. Uh, I, it's, I'm just uh, humbled, you know, to have my name along with uh, Carl Sagan, Buzz Aldrin, and, and just a whole bunch of folks uh, that received that award. So uh, it, it's just very humbling uh, uh, to have received that. And one of my favorites, I got uh, four patents along the way. And John Young uh, was when uh, he was uh, the presenter of these uh, patents. Uh, this was uh, for the reconfigurable fuzzy cell. And so John Young presented it to me and I go, oh my gosh, you know, I was kind of in a little bit of shock because here's the man that uh, was in a Gemini program. He flew in Gemini, uh, one of the 12 astronauts that walked on the moon for the Apollo program and as well as flying the shuttle. And, you know, presenting this award was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, you know, uh, give me a slap. I, I, I must be dreaming, but uh, it's one of the most memorable moments uh, uh, of my career. And so uh, let me just say a few words about a new direction, because I have found that all this knowledge uh, over the years and giving back to uh, students has been rewarding and beneficial. So I kind of kicked it up a few notches uh, over the last several years. And I've been involved with the Texas Space Grant Design Challenge. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for university students to take on projects that the NASA, uh, that the NASA Johnson Space Center uh, provides. And I've been the, uh, uh, the lead for that uh, effort in, in uh, uh, gathering uh, uh, design problems uh, for uh, university students in Texas uh, that are part of the uh, Texas Space Grant Consortium and taking on challenges. Like, for example, uh, I have one... Uh, in machine learning uh, interfaces. Uh, there's one on the uh, private uh, cloud and wireless uh, Internet of Things by uh, a colleague of mine, Chatwin Lonson. And uh, there's one, uh, interesting enough, from um, Lido's, uh, Tony Clark, who's a, um, a fellow in uh, lighting. And uh, she and I have one called Luminous Navigation Markers uh, for Lunar Surfaces. So when these students take on these projects, I tell them, you guys are going to learn systems engineering. Uh, it's going to be a benefit for you guys. And I have to say from over the years, some of the students that have come back and have gone to work in industry told me that it was very beneficial. So I was very proud that the, the effort that I spent uh, helping them to understand, you know, systems development, project development uh, was beneficial for them in their careers. Uh, and uh, there's more. Uh, I, I've done science experiments with uh, elementary school kids trying to convey that math and science is cool. I've, uh, I've uh, dealt with uh, uh, robotic uh, underwater uh, activities there at the uh, neutral buoyancy lab. Uh, I've uh, here's some pictures of uh, some of the uh, uh, universities that I've been involved with: uh, uh, Texas, uh, Texas State uh, University of North Texas, as well as uh, 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 Texas A&M University. Um, I've done the uh, high school for aerospace uh, programs and uh, the uh, NASA uh, Community College aerospace programs as well. I've, I've done uh, internet uh, uh, shows uh, with the Chicago museums. Uh, I've participated in the WB-57 uh, flight experiments uh, with Texas Southern University. I've spoken to uh, Boy Scouts and also shared my knowledge with uh, uh, Pathway interns at the at, uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. And uh, I'm very proud that I've also been involved with the University of Puerto Rico in Madagres. And uh, uh, this team, I, I, I did, a, I, I spent more time than, than I wanted to, but they were hungry for wanting to learn about systems engineering and the NASA process. Uh, they, they're just huge fans of NASA. And so uh, long story short was that uh, they were developing a concept for a lunar rover 
And so I, I helped them develop a systems uh, engineering plan uh, and a proposal that encompasses not just systems engineering, but human systems integration. And all that effort uh, paid off because they came in first place in the RASC, uh, NASA Rascal uh, uh, project. So I'm very proud of that. But I also was involved with the project uh, where they're trying to uh, uh, ex expand their capabilities at the University of Puerto Rico and Madagascar to make Puerto Rico competitive in the commercial space sector. So they were developing a um, a uh, liquid uh, fuel rocket. And though I'm not a propulsion guy, I understand, you know, systems development. And so I was helping them develop uh, the uh, systems engineering approach uh, for developing uh, that rocket. Uh, and it's just not uh, uh, here in the United States, but I've been involved with foreign uh, students as well uh, from India. There's uh, numerous pictures here uh, that you see students that have attended the webinars that I've given. Uh, helping them uh, to understand, uh, I guess, uh, what it takes to uh, to work at NASA, systems engineering at NASA. There's this lady on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, she's from India. At 17, she approached me that she wanted to come work for NASA. And I, it's, it's a long story. And I told her it's, it's going to be a long story. It's going to be a long haul for you uh, to come work at NASA. But she says, I don't care, so just give me the recipe. So I told her, you know, you're going to have to graduate with a bachelor's idea, come to the United States, get a master's, and then pursue a PhD, but find a professor that's doing work at NASA. Well, fast forward five, almost six years now, uh, she's uh, at, um, uh, I think she's in Pasadena, California now. She's pursuing her PhD in computer science and uh, human computer uh, interfaces associated with AI and uh, machine learning, and uh, she's uh, currently looking for a professor that, and she thinks she's found one that's doing work at JPL. So, uh, hats off to her for uh, you know for that uh, <laughs> that long road uh, getting there. And uh, uh, you know, webinars I've done numerous uh, ones. Uh, I've done some in Africa, again India. I've done Australia, uh, Bangladesh most recently uh, as well. I, I, it's just amazing. I, I you know, I'm considered uh, uh, a star, if you will, but I, you know, I'm very humbled by that. But I'm, I'm just trying to you know, share knowledge and help students. If I can do it all, all over the world, I think my parents and my grandparents would be very proud uh, to have seen uh, where I've come from and where I am right now, uh, sharing knowledge. And um, so I. I'm, I'm very thankful for my upbringing that, uh, that helps me uh, do this kind of work. Uh, final words, um, uh, this is one uh, that I remember a branch chief telling me that uh, don't be so busy, busy making a living that you forget to make a life. And that's so true, you know, money and power is not everything. I love, uh, uh, you know, doing these outreach uh, uh, and, and, and seeing the sparkle in the, uh, in the students' eyes when they learn something new. Uh, or helping students, uh, you know, prepare them for careers in engineering. Practice gratitude daily. Um, if I, I tell students, if you don't know the name of the janitor in your building, um, there's something wrong here because uh, even the janitor, as a story was conveyed to me one time, uh, is part of a, is a team. So if you think about it, it's the janitor that keeps your room clean, keeps the, the bathrooms clean, that makes for a, a nice working environment. So I, I've always gone and come to learn uh, the names of every janitor in my building, starting with uh, Mona Gonzalez uh, back when I first started in Building 44. In fact, uh, there was only three Hispanics in Building 44. There was uh, Mona, myself, and a, uh, and a contractor that worked for Lockheed uh, at that time by the name of uh, James Ferriol. Um, give back, uh, become a mentor, do outreach, help those left behind. I, I share this with university students as well. Once you go out there, give back, you know, uh, try doing what I'm trying to do is to help somebody else, you know, reach back, put your hand and bring somebody that's, uh, that's uh, struggling as uh, I was struggling and I'm helping uh, people uh, that are struggling uh, become uh, successful. 
uh, get out of your comfort zone. You may find a new beginning. Uh, that's something that I've learned over the years, and that's why I got into human systems integration. Some of my colleagues say, why did you get into that human touchy-feely stuff? But it's important. It's important for my job, and it's important to understand that. And uh, another thing that I've shared with students that if you haven't learned something uh, that day, uh, you need to you know you need to re, uh, reassess uh, yourself because we should be learning something. There's too much to learn uh, in a lifetime. So if you can learn something each day, uh, I think you will benefit. And grades don't measure how successful you are. I, I can't tell you how many students uh, have listened to my story, and uh, and I tell them that I wasn't a straight A student. I wasn't you know uh, summa cum laude and uh, you know ta beta pi and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, what does work is perseverance and your ability to take what you have learned and adapt, innovate, and that will help you uh, become successful. I, I've known a, a, a couple of, uh, you know, that were very good in school with book learning, but not very good with real world problems. Uh, in the best functioning teams, you can't tell who's wearing a badge. And I, I, I have to say that that's something that just came natural to me when I was working at NASA is that when I was working with contractors, there was no NASA or, or, or Lockheed or, or, uh, or uh, CSI at the time and other these uh, contractors. It was just a team that we all had the same objective and that's to uh, have a successful project. And then the best tools uh, for creativity, I'm told this by uh, elementary, uh, elementary school students and sometimes middle and high school uh, for foreign countries say, what, what, uh, what tools do you use, you know, for creativity and, and come up with all these wonderful ideas? And I, I tell them, I said, paper, pencil, uh, your brain in a quiet environment. And that's all it is. Um, so I, I want to thank again, uh, uh, Lito and Ola for inviting me to share my story as part of Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. And uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. And let me... Uh, Stop sharing. Okay. George, um, question for you. Yes, sir. How, how important is for you uh, your Hispanic heritage? How, how do you think that help you become be where you at? Okay, so that's a good question because I, I can tell you that one of the things that reflected in my mind when I was going to school, when I was challenged with calculus, when I was challenged with all these classes and stuff like that, reflecting back on the, uh, if you, you saw the pictures of my grandparents that had no formal education, uh, they were laborers. Uh, my dad, you know, uh, uh, he, he had only a fourth grade education. My mom had a second grade education. I didn't mention this, but she was also an orphan. And so that... Uh, that and then you know of course they, they they did what they could you know to you know provide food and and, and comfort for for us and you know, we uh, we were never I never considered myself poor in the sense that you know we had a roof over our head and food uh, but you know the uh, the Hispanic heritage of uh, of uh, in, of uh, family of work ethic of responsibility of compassion these things that came as part of of the heritage of my family that was in part of me, helped me, I, I think, to a great degree, uh, help overcome some of the challenges I had. And, and just not at the university, but also at work. I had some very challenging uh, projects that I undertook, and some of them I was learning uh, at the seat of my pants, and it was sick or swim. And so, um, again, just reflecting back on uh, where I came from and you know who my family is uh, was, uh, was a very uplifting and beneficial thing for me. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for your time and for give back uh, to the community and being a mentor for us Hispanics. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, what is the recipe for overcome uh, and build confidence um, after you have failed a couple of classes? Oh, uh, boy. Um, yeah, so... Um... You know, failure, uh, as I started to learn, is uh, uh, 
you don't you don't fail you fail when you stop trying and so uh i've uh there were some classes that i took that i had to retake but uh you know i learned uh what um what my sh my shortcomings were and you know if there's no failure uh, you, you can't you can't improve uh, uh i have yet to know of anybody at nasa that has had a, a, a project that had no failures at all, uh, whether it was in technology or dealing with people. So I have to say that um, you know you 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 accept. I, I don't want to call it a failure, but you you accept the setback as a learning experience and build on that. that and that's important. And there's where perseverance comes in place. If that if that makes sense. Thank you. George, thank you very much. We've been friends for a long time, did a lot of work together. Yeah. It's a pleasure to hear of your history. I look I look forward to seeing you in person one one of these days. <laughs> okay. All right. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Any other questions for George? George, I can tell you, this is one of the best presentation I ever been part of. Uh, your life, your dedication, uh, your experience is something that uh, really uh, for Hispanic, for people, who, you know, anyone who have had uh, right now worked hard and there's a few People that are listening right now that uh, they can learn from you. Uh, I, know, I see their names and they need to understand that uh, do not feel that that you they cannot make it. Si se puede. And they can continue and set their goals and, uh, you know, like you, uh, become, uh, realize all their, their goals. And most importantly, that we always need to look at how to pay forward, how we're gonna help people in need. There's always someone else, someone out there that is in a worse situation than us. And uh, we need to realize uh, how much we have and uh, our family. And uh, Ola uh, wants to give you, in a, uh, present you uh, we're going to send you, I know you can see my screen. Uh, let me present that real quick for all to see. Uh, where are you? Where are you? We have uh, Pedro, the engineer, is our award. And I, I hope you can see it right now. Yes, uh, I can. We will, we will send you. One, the person who's in charge of that right now, he's in a meeting, you know. Me, everybody who works at NASA knows uh, meeting are us, right? She's right now attending a meeting, but uh, this is a, a replica of what we're gonna send you soon. Uh, and again, thank you for your t time and most importantly, thank, thank you for all what you do for the community. Well, thank you. It's my honor to have been uh, uh, a guest and thank you for inviting me to be a speaker. Okay, if the, there's any other question that you like uh, uh, guys uh, to ask. Uh, okay, if not, thank you again and thank you for coming to our uh, deal. Our next presentation, by the way, tomorrow we're going to be playing Loteria. Uh, you are welcome to attend. Uh, I can send you the link, uh, 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 George, if you want to play Loteria with us. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'll send you the link. It's going to be like this. We had the cards and everything. As a matter of fact, I have it around here. And uh, we'll play an hour Loteria during noontime, something like that. And uh, then next week, we'll bring uh, our next speaker is uh, George, uh, sorry, Juan, uh, Jose Hernandez, an uh, ex astronaut. He also is going to talk about his uh, experience as a Hispanic uh, coming from the farms in uh, California. 
to become an astronaut. Thanks again, and uh, keep uh, following us on our websites. All right. Thank you. Wait, not yet. Oh, yeah. It's too late. He's gone. Thank you.